Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining today. Uh, my name is Shaker Krishnan. Uh, I'm a Democrat running for city council in our communities of Elmhurst and Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, and it's so nice to see all of you here uh, and for our uh, Thursday uh, weekly conversations on issues affecting our communities uh, and our city. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for joining tonight for a very special discussion that we have uh, with uh, two of the realist organizers that I know in this city that are doing really grassroots movement-based work um, that uh, is so important for so many of us right here in Queens uh, and around our city too. Um, today's topic uh, is so important because we're thinking about issues that are really consuming our country right now, not just our city, not just Queens, but the entire country as well. When it comes to gun, and gang violence, and how we think about what are the causes, the root causes behind violence, and how do we engage our youth, and especially communities of color, in stopping violence, and how do we perceive it, and how do we react, not just react to it, but proactively address it in ways that are actually constructive, restorative, and positive in building community. And I think that these are issues that are most affecting, especially poor communities of color and immigrant neighborhoods that are facing every day issues of policing, issues of gun and gang violence and finding ways to address them to make sure that we're actually building a healthy community for our youth, for our families and for the generations to come after us. But that really requires a critical and unique perspective on how we go about the work of addressing violence and stopping violence. And that doesn't require just reacting to it but actually a much more fundamental perspective on how we think about violence, what causes it, and how do we address it in a constructive way. Violence interrupter work is so critical in our city and it's happening in communities of color around New York. And it's proven to be some of the most effective ways of stopping violence in our communities by actually investing in and supporting our youth, deterring them from violence but in proactive ways that helps to bring them up and build them up and not lock them up or punish them. We need to invest far more as a city in our violence interrupters and programs like Cure Violence that do so much on the ground as statistics show, and as we'll hear tonight, to really address the scourge of violence in our communities, but to do so from a perspective of building up and building together. With that view in mind, I wanna welcome you tonight two panelists who are here to talk about exactly these issues, who have done the work in our neighborhoods and who understand the importance of addressing violence and working with our youth in this way. We have both with us Kay Bain and Juan Ramos, two brothers in this work who, as I said before, are two of the most respected organizers in the city when it comes to combating violence and addressing violence. And so we're gonna talk about what violence is, what it means to treat violence as a public health issue, when we talk about trauma and trauma in our communities, how does that affect and influence violence as well? And how do we address it in a restorative way? So with that perspective, I wanna thank you all for coming, those who are listening on our uh, Facebook Live as well. And I wanna start out uh, with Kay Bain. Uh, Kay, first of all, thank you for coming today. You've done such incredible work in being the founder of the 696 Build Queens Bridge program in Queensbridge Houses that has really made history in the way that it has stopped violence at Queensbridge houses and set a record for how long there have been no shootings at the projects there too. It's a program that's gotten citywide attention for the work that you've done. And so I just wanted to talk a bit about in doing this work in Queens and doing this work at Queensbridge, let's start from the be very beginning. What got you into violence interrupter work? And why is that so important? What exactly is violence interrupter work? And why was it so important to take it on in Queensbridge houses? So first and foremost, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. This is not the first time we've had opportunity to dialogue. You've invited me in the past to be a part of community mobilizations. Um, when I hear the, the name Juan Ramos is involved, then I already know there's a certain level of integrity. There's a certain level of expertise in the conversation. So thank you once again for allowing me the time and space. Um, and I know Andy is on there as well, who helped to connect me to you in the past. So Absolutely. To, to jump into the work um, in Queensbridge, so first and foremost, it's human justice work. It, so what we run is a human justice site 
that utilizes an evidence-based model called cure violence and also other pieces of models that have been shown and demonstrated to reduce violence, to eliminate conflicts and prevent retaliations in communities of color. I'm talking about neighborhoods and communities where you are nine and 10 times more likely to be shot and killed. So the work that we do has, again, been noted, I gotta correct you, not just around the city, but around the country and around the world. We've had parliament, people from different countries and continents fly out to sit with us to say, what exactly is it that you all are doing that allow for these types of undeniable results? And part of why we went to Queensbridge houses, six blocks, 96 buildings, over 8,000 people on an average day inside of this small confined geography. We went there intentionally to try out some of the good practices that we knew had provided us with outcomes in the past. When you look at the Black Panther Party, when you look at the Young Lords, when you look at community organizers historically and the spirit of self-determination, one in which the people were at the center of the change that was happening, we know that we, we, we were onto something and we need to tap into it. So let me just very quickly explain. Human justice means it's an equation actually. It, it says to us that human rights plus human development equals human justice. So human rights is a level of awareness. The people need a certain amount of information. The people have to know and understand what their rights are, how they should be respected. There was a shortage of that. There's a lack of that in our communities. You're an attorney. So many times people that you're meeting with historically in the past were not aware of the level of their rights that had been violated. Mm -hmm. So that is the first aspect of human justice work to increase awareness. The second component is development. And that refers to resources. We were fortunate enough and Juan worked with me on this through the years, we worked together on it um, in building a system around New York City. It's now between 24 and 27 locations, the crisis management system of New York in which we still fight day in and day out with the leadership in the city to pull and provide resources in real ways into the hands of those communities and those leaders on the ground that have been disinvested and marginalized um, for so long. So you have human rights, the information, the awareness, connect that to resources and the devil is in the details. You can't just say, you know, this money has been slated to go here. It's about how, in what hands. It's a lot to be said about the human development component. But when we have these two together, then we know we have a chance at human justice. Another thing that's important to state, when we start at criminal as a starting point, as in criminal justice, we can't land or end anywhere well. We spend over $227 billion a year arresting people in this country, and it has not worked. So, and that's when you include incarceration, lawyers, judges, everyone's fees, right? What we know is that when we give people the power, right? You talk about restorative justice, but human justice is really where it's at. And the last thing I'll say on the framework of human justice is there's a methodology. We understand that change occurs when we act in three spaces simultaneously. So we have community empowerment. When you look at the work in Queensbridge houses, you will see initiatives led by the community, launched by the community, embraced by the community. That's community empowerment. It is the voice of the people that is being mobilized. And then we see system change. So we work on policies that we see to be unfair. Environmental racism comes to mind when we talk about Queensbridge and the oils that are burning in that, in that um, and that housing development. Um, and then, so this system change, it has to happen along with community empowerment. And the last thing, but all simultaneously is individual transformation. The direct services we provide are unprecedented. We are able to engage in places where quite literally others can't, many are afraid to go, but it's because we are real models. We come from those experiences. When you're talking about one, you're talking about somebody who has walked the walk, been in all the trenches, has made those mistakes and has learned from them. So there's a level of credibility in the engagement when you have credible messengers or real models who have made that shift and are now working with youth to provide some more opportunities. Thank you, Kay, for that. And I think that's such a powerful perspective that you bring up in, in two respects. One, when you start out thinking about this as a criminal system or criminal justice in that sense, you're already labeling a system uh, for an end result uh, that dehumanizes uh, the individuals, especially who get caught up, especially young people of color, um, from start to finish in this Jim Crow system that we have. Um, the second thing I would, I would ask, because I like how you mentioned that there was an issue of um, human justice and approaching it from that perspective. 
So tell us a little bit about um, what got you involved in the work in Queensbridge Houses. What was the challenges you faced when you walked into Queensbridge, when you started uh, the, the Cure Violence program there? Uh, and what kind of work have you done uh, over there now to get us to the result that we're at today in Queensbridge? Right. So the first thing, um, first and foremost, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm from the most populated borough in the city. So you learn a lot when you come from this type of environment, right? And it's very applicable. I'm saying this because the human needs, the universality of the human need is undeniable. And what works inside of Queensbridge houses also works inside of Polo Grounds, inside of Bushwick, inside the Bronx. So let's not lose sight on and overemphasize the geography. But we went to Queensbridge intentionally. And before I had a job, before I had an office, a closet to hang my jacket in, I asked 1,200 people in that housing development about their needs. I spent three, four weeks. I went at one o'clock in the afternoon. I went at one o'clock in the morning. Because in a community, those of us know, you have two communities. There's one that exists in the daytime and one at the night. So if you really want to get into the core and the heartbeat and the rhythm of the community, you have to know both sides of that equation. And so I, I initially did it myself. Then I had four volunteers. Those four people eventually became staff. Those four turned to eight and 12. And we asked, again, over 1,200 people questions about where do you feel safest in the community? Where do you feel the most unsafe? What is the power dynamic that is, that is most challenging to you? Are you more interested in educational opportunities or employment? We asked. We tried to do seven minute unscientific surveys. Sometimes they would allow us to go longer, but in all of these inquiries and questions and tablets that we were filling up with information, we were then able to figure out what our steps would be in terms of programming. And I don't think that there are enough organizations that take that step. It's, it's something that, it's not new, but it's innovative to bring it back and say, you know what, let's ask people, here's an idea. Let's ask people um, how they feel. So every program that we, in, we launched in Queensbridge was based on two things, what the community said they wanted and needed and what our staff members, my staff was 99% formerly incarcerated women and men, what their passion and gift areas were. So someone like Tiffany Austin in Queensbridge Houses comes from one of the largest families in um, that housing development said, I want to work with young women around these issues and I want to do women's empowerment. So we emp empowered her to do that. We supported her vision to do that. And the reason that we had uh, a boxing self-defense mental discipline pro program was because 86% of the people that we asked the questions said they wanted to know how to avoid situations. And if they couldn't, how to use their hands to get away from an attacker. So again, and I can list a multiplicity of programs, but they all came from this same approach. And what I'm describing for you is a part of our human and healing justice approach to working in communities of color. So CCD is the organization that was born from 696 Bill Queensbridge. Here's something also worth mentioning, it's pretty revolutionary. You had a program inside of the housing development doing remarkably well in terms of just addressing some of the intergenerational communication gaps, um, getting people in the community who historically, we call it on site, would see each other and it's firearms blazing. We were able to get into these and create mediations to get people to see some common ground. We provided some opportunities and we did it not by getting people jobs. We did it by attacking and addressing the mindset. We focused on human and healing justice entrepreneurship and scalability. We got people to start seeing themselves as producers, owners, savers, investors. We had people that we said, okay, you're walking around with a firearm, but you don't have a 10 year plan. You don't have a three year goal and you don't have a one year plan. So we created a tool called the SGP, a sustainable growth plan. And if there was one tool that I could get a billion people on the planet earth to put into their hands, um, it would be this tool and my soul would be clean because in this tool, there's three parts and I'll just tell you quickly what they are. The first is called aspiration mapping where you get people who have literally and figuratively had their imaginations beaten out of them. I'm talking about black and brown people in communities of color, poverty pockets. You give them the ability to imagine and to see themselves in 10 years. Many of us were never told that we would live to see 25. So to do that, this tool already is remarkable. Then it looks at what is your purpose? How do you identify your why? These are things that in some households is common knowledge. It's talked about at the dinner table, but at many it's not. 
in school buildings, it's not. So understanding your purpose, understanding your aspirations, um, and then lastly, looking at your needs. How do you meet your needs? As I stated earlier, human beings, we have these universal human needs. You need to feel safe. If you live in Astoria, if you live in Elmhurst, Ravenswood, Jackson Heights, you need to feel, that's a human need. I share that need no matter where I live, I need that. The second need that we address is spontaneity. You need to feel alive, risk. The third need, we, so we go through human needs. Um, and the second component of this is we look at your associations. We look at how do you, how do you use your social capital? Sometimes you can tell where a person is headed by the networks and the way that they interact and the yeah. direction of those around them. So we take a, a very, very clinical, critical look at social capital. And we work with young people on this. The last and third and final component is called content management. And that is about protecting your thoughts. That's about understanding that, you know, your thoughts actually create things. And as much as we know to protect our physical bodies, we have to invest in systems and methods and ways that respect our mental health and our self-care. And when you're in survival mode, as I come from, you ask, how did I get in this work? I got in this work because I was 15 years old, looking at 15 years in prison for a fist fight. I got in this work because my brother just came home from 100 months in a federal facility for a kingpin charge. I come from communities where, you know, I was told by my high school principal that I would not live to be 21 years old. I was told that by my father, right? I was deemed uh, ineducable in elementary school, my brothers and I. We were told we needed Ritalin to stay in a school building, we, we would not be able to learn to read, to write, right? So that's what draws me and has drawn me to this work. Um, the struggle that we all face, and some of us have been fortunate enough to escape and feel the obligation, the need to be present for those who may not have some of the same privileges, opportunities, or fortune. Um, and that's why we do this work. Thank you, Kay. That was powerful to hear. Um, and thank you for getting us that background and perspective, too. I'm going to kind of switch back and forth between you and Juan a bit, too. Um, so, Juan, I want to give you an opportunity to. Uh, we've worked uh, together for a long time, brother, and I know um, the incredible work that you do every day. In addition to it, your background, in addition to housing work, too, has been in balance and interrupted work, whether it's uh, right now in Bushwick Houses or before that in Bed Stuy. So, I want to give you a sense to talk about one, how you got into this work, and two, how do we approach issues of, of violence. When we talk about uh, trauma, uh, inter intergenerational trauma, how does that play into violence? Maybe you can give us a perspective first of your background and also how you think about violence in the relationship with trauma. Um, well, thank you, Shaker, for the opportunity. Um, it's great to be on here with you. You, again, um, great, done great work with you, so I really appreciate it. Um, and it's an honor always to be my brother, Kay Bain, who I look at, you know, as a leader of this, you know, not just in this city, but around this country. Um, you guys are having an opportunity to hear from someone who not only, you know, does this work daily, but truly believes in what he's saying and, and that's transparent in everything he does. So I appreciate it. Um, you know, for me, um, the perspective is really, you know, to Kay Bain's point, um, it, it's about that human element, right? Um, looking at the communities that we're in and how we're able to serve them. Um, you know, so for me, um, the way that I got into this work was really about, you know, toward the end of what Kay Bain was saying, how does that um, kind of generational thing play out, right? Not so much generational in the sense of, you know, replaying and getting, doing things over and over, um, you know, in a familial way, but how does the, um, how do the things that happen to you as young people beginning in your home transcends to what happens to you on the streets or what you embrace on the streets, right? So, you know, for those that know my story, you know the story, you know, for me, um, I was looking at, you know, one point in my life, um, I was looking at a RICO where I was gonna do, you know, a long time in prison um, because I chose to embrace gang violence on the street. You know, I chose to be part of a street organization um, and through that process, um, found myself um, looking at, you know, looking at that, my only window being prison or, or death, basically, right? And it took the investment of community people, similar to the, like the work we're doing now. It took investment of community people, organizers, former young lords, former Black Panthers, who came into my life and said, you know what? If you have the ability to speak to young people and get them to join you, join your group, join your gang, join, you know, what you're doing, why don't you use that to better your community? And I didn't, you know, because to me, sticking it to the man, 
just meant doing everything to contradict power. But in order to contradict power, you got to get involved in what Cain Bain saying. How do we build our community by putting into our minds that, you know, um, that the mindset needs to change, first of all, right? And then when we build community, um, we see, you know, some of us believe that the things we do on the streets, you know, that's the only option we have. And that that's, that's our survival mode, right? That's what we've learned. That's what we've learned. That's what we've been taught. But the reality is that there, there are different ways of doing that in order to um, promote safety in your community, to keep yourself safe in your community, keep your family safe in your community. And, you know, I, I dare everybody here to think about it. When you think about the, the, the safest you ever felt in your life, right? Do you see a police officer in that picture? I guarantee most of you are going to say no. Because yep. the safest time for me was you know, near my grandparents, in my home, by the people that were raising me, doing something I like, or in my community, doing something that I enjoyed. But it never involved having to go to police because my, my neighbor is unsafe. It never involved me having to, you know, um, deal with police interactions. So for me, that was part of um, what kind of led me into the work. And as I was facing that, as you know, it was also the fact that I lost my younger brother to gun violence not because he was killed, but because he took a life and was sentenced to 21 to life, you know? And, and thank God, knock on wood, my brother just came home and because I transformed my life, right? Because I challenged myself and tried to do this work differently, I was able to support him and knock on wood, he's been out now for, you know, two and a half years after doing 21 years at the age of 17. So he spent his entire almost adult life in prison Right. Didn't have any kids, came home to try to start a brand new life. Didn't know what a cell phone was, you know, anything like that. Um, you know, but, um, you know, those are the um, transformational things that we that we do through this work. Um, and to Kay Bain's point. Right. Um, it's something that's been proven to work. Right. That when you put people that have similar experiences and similar backgrounds to talk to those that are having similar issues. That that works. Right. It works if you allow it to work because you can't just, you know, I can tell a young person put down your gun. And I also want to put into this that, you know, while we talk about young people all the time because we focus on them and they are involved in, in gun and gang violence, that we also have a generation out there that hasn't, you know, that's already an adult that's generation right. that's also still impacted and involved and sometimes incarcerated because some of these issues that we can't forget. Right. Because there, there aren't as many resources poured into them either. Um, you know, that when we ask someone to put down a gun, unless you have a resource for them, there isn't going to be other options because guess what? The only thing I know to put food in, on the table for my family is to go sell something, is to be involved in violence, right? So if we don't provide resources or give them, you know, a different perspective on how to change their, their mindset, right, to think differently, then you're, ne you're never going to have great results, right? And you know, this is the power of that work, investing in people who have that experience, who then can pass that experience of change to other young people in their lives. And, you know, for me, I can tell you that I didn't embrace violence on the streets, right? For me, I learned violence at home. I learned violence by watching, you know, my stepfather beat my mother to a pulp on most nights, right? And wanting to get away from that is how I ended up going to the streets, right? Right. And when I embraced that violence, although it felt good to, to deal with some of that violence back then, it, it took me, you know, undoing some of that trauma that I had experienced at home through people that invested in me and a community that embraced me and gave me a second opportunity to really do the work, that trauma-informed work of saying, this is the origin of my, my trauma. This is the origin of my violence. This is why my younger brother, you know, found it so easy to take a life because he knew what it was, um, he knew what violence was way before he hit the streets. Right. He knew what violence was way before he picked up a gun, right? So those are the things that we have to overcome, right? Because you, you point, uh, we can point out someone who we claim to be the gangbanger, to be the problem, to be that, that kid that nobody wants to talk to. And I can point you at the same person and tell you, this is the trauma he, he suffered. This is what he's been through. And this is how everybody walked out of his life and everybody, you know, continued the level of disinvestment that he saw within our communities, right? And, and that's why we do the work. And my biggest honor was to be able to do that, like you mentioned early, in my home community of Bed-Stuy, for example, and setting up a program there to cut into some of these things because it gave me the opportunity to work with me. And what I mean by that is 
to look at those black and brown faces in my community that I grew up with or around and be able to provide a different set of opportunities, right? And this is what this work does. This is what this work um, leads to if you invest in it. Um, and, there were, and, and to Kay Bain's point, the history of it points out that black and brown communities here who have been always organizing has said that this is a possibility if you invest in this. You know, but again, it took that organizing, like you said in your intro, right? How do we invest in those people that are organizing around this issue and invest and give them the proper um, support to implement these things in our community, right? Because, you know, people before us, um, organizing and whatever were saying, we need this, but it took those organizers continuing to fight. And it took finally, you know, a body at a city council and, and a mayor that was willing to at least try to implement this. And now it went from first being like seven, eight different um, organizations doing the work on the ground to over 20. Um, and, and then doing the work glo you know, globally now, right? Kay Bain travels the country and around the world sometimes talking about this. So, you know, it works, right? But you have to invest in it and believe in transformation because it's not gonna happen overnight. You're not just gonna set up shop and believe that in, in a week or two, you're gonna see change. It takes change to get people to begin to believe and let go of the level of, of, of trust that they, distrust they have with systems in their lives, especially disinvestment when you talk about NYCHA, right? Mm -hmm. Disinvestment that they've seen, you know, in their housing, disinvestment they've seen in their representation, you know, within the criminal justice system when it overwhelmingly impacts them. Disinvestment when we talk about how, how am I supposed to feel safe with this person in a uniform when I just know them to be the person that harassed me every day, stopped me every day, or throw me up against the wall every day, right? Um, you know, so when we talk about, for example, defunding police, that's what the reality of it is. How do we take some of those resources and invest it in the people that actually need that level of investment in their lives? Because if you could spend $50,000 a year on me in prison, give me that as a paycheck. Yeah. Give me that as a form of investment in my community where I can build myself up, build my family up and give myself an opportunity and that my community has that around me. So I don't want to be long-winded on it, but that's kind of like the gist of, of, of how we how I approach this work, how we look at this work. You know, you have to not only invest in the individuals you want to change, but invest in the individual individuals also providing that level of access to change. Thank you, Juan, for saying that too. Um, and I and that perspective okay. as well. Go ahead, okay. Yeah, I, you want to no, I, was, I was saying well said. Um Division of Criminal Justice Services, New York State says when there's a homicide, it costs four hundred and forty one thousand dollars. When there's mm -hmm. a shoot, it costs between seventy and ninety thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So we prevent thousands of shootings a year. Check, please. Mm -hmm. Send over the check. Um, we again I have I can show you text messages in my phone right now from law enforcement. Hey K Bain, would you mind going to check that out? Before there's a problem, the work that we do doesn't go to ComStat, it doesn't make it to the cover of the newspaper, it doesn't get spoken about very because we prevent violence from happening. Exactly. Yeah. Every one of our offices has a mediation room. We're contractually obligated to have a space where we just, all of our staff members are trained to mediate conflicts. They know how to do that in expert fashion. Mm -hmm. and, and to add to that point, Shaker, really quickly. Yeah, um, sure. You know, e even when there is that point where we weren't be we weren't able to be contacted, right? On a night that something's popping off, and someone might get picked up or whatever, to think about a transformation and mind change. I could tell you in Bed Stuy, one of the best feelings I had several times was the fact that when one of the young people I was working with was picked up, even the, even I remember one in particular picked up on a gun charge, and that precinct commander called me at two in the morning and said, I picked up one of the young men you're working with. We have him on a gun charge. He's going to be going down to the bookings. Um, I just thought you should know. And, and when I said to him, and you know what I'm going to say to you next? He says, I know exactly why I'm calling you. You want to invoke his rights. I can't ask him anything else. You want me to make sure that I know that he's going to have a lawyer when he gets to the court, because it's not about, you know, already throwing the, you know, locking that young man away and throwing away the key is about what are we gonna do now to intervene so he can never find himself in that situation again? And how are we gonna to intervene to make sure that the individual that he has a problem with doesn't believe that he needs to retaliate in a certain way? Because guess what? They're not foes, they're neighbors. Exactly, exactly. 
That's a great, that's a great point. And, and you know, thank you for saying that, Juan. And also, Kay, I wanted to ask you too, Juan talked a bit about the relationship between trauma um, and, and violence and, and you know, intergenerational trauma and violence. Um, and actually, by the way, everyone else, um, it, this is a good time if you want to start. I see some questions already um, in the chat or being sent to me. If you want to drop questions in, on, if you're listening on Facebook, um, on Facebook Live or message to me on the chat or in the chat, we'll, we'll make sure to start asking them. So we'll move to questions in a bit. Um, but okay, one question I had for you was shifting gears a little bit too. One of the things that's become, uh, that's gotten global attention about the 696 Bill Queensbridge program has been this approach of treating gun violence as a public health crisis. What does that mean? How do we think about, why, what does that mean to say gun violence is a public health issue? That's, that's a very important question. I don't know Juan can speak on that. I mean, but it goes back to the humanity that's missing, mm -hmm. right? We, so what is a public health crisis, period? You know, what are, what are those issues and what, what, emotional connotation does that have a public health crisis it doesn't sound like something that leads you to blame a people it doesn't sound like you know terminology that allows you to feel like there should be oppression after that statement public health crisis is about humanizing the fact that hurt people hurt people and it hurts when when you opened up you said the root cause what a profound and revolutionary approach Imagine if we look at the root causes behind things. And then whenever we ran into speed bumps, whenever things went a little to the left and things went off rail, we didn't resort immediately back to what we know doesn't work every time. If we could stay the course, and when we stay the course, you will have things like what we saw in bed -Stuy when Juan set up uh, the camps out there, the teams out there, he changed the culture. He gave people who didn't have no another way to say, to create a space to say, because what happens is the programming, let's get to the root cause. Violence is something that we were trained and programmed and socialized into because we were treated violently outside our homes. I came from a home where I was, I was beat. I wasn't spanked. I wasn't ground. I wasn't timed out. I was beat. And I was beat because in the tradition of slavery, my mother in a single parent home had to prepare me for when I walked outside of the door for the environment that I would face, where I could be violated physically by law enforcement or other, and there would be no justice or no recourse. So I remember being a young man and getting into physical confrontation and saying, my mother hits harder than you. We are trained from two, three, four years old. And before that, historically, our people have suffered ridiculous, brutal, public violence. So all of this is, is all crafted into the music, into the media, into everything. We absorb it. And then we are responsible for not knowing how to deal with those traumas, to process that post-traumatic slave syndrome. We are accountable for that. We are incarcerated for that. But there was no fixing. There was no mass mental health uh, you know, initiative for people who have suffered at the hands of slavery and poverty. There has never been that in this country, but we are to be accountable. Let's take that same energy, that finger pointing, that blame that you've done and, and really stick on this root cause mm -hmm. and stay there. That's powerful. And I think you're absolutely right. It's like looking at these, the roots the root causes itself uh, and seeing this broader approach to violence. It doesn't just come out of nowhere, it doesn't start from nowhere, but it has these roots in mental health services that are needed, uh, trauma, uh, and violence going back for generations too. Um, one more question, Juan, that I have for you. Just really, to... really, oh, okay. really Sorry. quickly, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're dealing right now, for example, with, with a public health crisis, right? Yep. And, you got to think about what levels of interventions have been put in place in order to keep much more people from, you know, dying, keeping much more people from becoming infected, keeping much more people, you know, from being exposed, right? So when we look at a public health crisis, what things are we putting in place to prevent people from being, you know, um, killed off by this, right? So why not look at violence in the same way? If we can interrupt the transmission of violence, right? And, and, and kind of revert that back to where people are saying to themselves, like, why am I behaving this way? What in my life has affected me, right? If we did that level of investment, right? So when we see them, um, when we see them in, in the river and, and they're, um, 
you know, um, drowning instead of driving in to try to save them and then give them no, no, you know, no oxygen when they do you pull them out. Why don't you swim up the river and, and take your time and say, well, let me go up the river and see why they're, they're coming down drowning. Right. Because when you do that, the level of investment alone That's in true. someone's life shows them that you're not yet another system in their life that's providing some form of trauma, right? Because again, we got to look at the, the communities we work in. It's, it's not just the violence. It's systems of oppression that yep. systemically Absolutely. have over decades and years and hundreds of years have done this to people of color, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we have to look at how that systemic racism, how that systemic violence, how that systemic um, structure is in place and who's deeply impacted by it. Because I guarantee you, it's always the one that you're pointing the finger to saying, you need to stop it without giving them an option on how to stop it or a reason to stop it. Um, because to them is all I know is how I survive. But to you, it's criminal behavior. That's because you never take the time to ask me, young man, how you doing? Right? That officer never took the time to ask me, how was your day, young man? He was too busy thinking how should I throw him up against the wall and what charge am I going to illegally tell him I'm looking, searching him, searching him for, you know, before I let him go. That's what the level of violence is in our communities and in, in, in communities where high levels of different disinvestment create high tolerance of pain. That's what we deal with, yep. right? In our communities, black and brown communities in particular, we deal with a high level of pain that in order to de-escalate, there needs to be something different done, right? Because you can't throw nothing at me that I haven't survived. And, and you ask us why we act tough? That's why we act tough. Because I live with a high tolerance of pain. Mm -hmm. I believe there's nothing you can throw at me that I haven't survived in my community. And we need to show people, you know, we care for them. That we're not just gonna set up shop and leave overnight, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's other things that we can talk about at another time, right? Like as a CBO, I'm constantly looking at, am I running my course here? Do I need to re rethink how we're doing the work here? because I should be working toward empowering people enough for me to get out of that community and let them take over, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And this is, again, to Kay Bain's point, how you know he's out there educating people on much more than just ending violence because it, it, it's, it's survival, right? When you give them so much more, when you give them other tools for them to be able to take forward. Juan, you know what violence, real quick, violence is that black and brown families are five and a half times more underbanked than mainstream America. Violence okay. is that Queensbridge houses, the median income is $15,387, but you go four blocks to the east and it's $140,000 median income. That's violence. Absolutely. Violence That's 2021, violent. and you have rats the size of small cats and possums running through, it's, it's in the most affluent nation, in the most affluent city, a global city, you have rats and roaches bigger than your hands and feet. That's violence. The level mm -hmm. six oil that burns in the boilers that they never allowed to continue in the Upper East Side mm -hmm. where people don't have melanin and they allow it to happen over 20 years and still going on at Alice. That's violence. And you Absolutely. think people don't know, understand and appreciate what is happening and how they're being treated, but they do. And when there's no one around, we internalize it and we focus it back on ourselves. And that's what you see. And mm -hmm. so... It's very easy to point the finger at that. It's very easy to turn your nose down at that. And that has happened for way too long. Instead of doing that, we have pulled our sleeves up. We have gotten next to with the people. We have listened to people. We have been empowered by people and trusted by the community. Um, and that's why we are here today. I think two things that both of you said that was so powerful. One was one, as you said, systems of oppression um, that, that, are, that are really creating this, this crisis we have in the first place, this public health crisis. And two, Katie, your point too, you're absolutely right. It's violence that we think about. And we look at the median income in Queensbridge houses being 15K and you go two blocks you know, to the west or east and it's 100 plus K the median income. I mean that, and I think that's that system perspective that needs to change on like what, you know, what is oppression and what, what, what is violence? Because you're absolutely right. That's a very powerful way to say it. Um, and that leads me, you know, I see a couple of questions here in the chat that I want to get to. Um, so I'll just ask one more question that I see some comments about housing um, to both of you too. You know, Juan, you and I have done a lot of work in the projects together uh, around tenants and representing tenants. Um, you've just made the link, both of you, to 
housing um, and, and violence. And I wanna just, you can talk a little bit more about that. What is it, especially when you talk about NYCHA, what has NYCHA's response been to the violence interrupted work happening? Uh, we know when we sue, go after NYCHA, how unresponsive they are to housing problems. They say, oh, it's a federally, can't do anything about it. Um, we were just dealing recently with a family that was illegally locked out of their apartment because of, because by NYCHA. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the relationship between housing and especially public housing um, and this work and violence and trauma? Yeah, um, you know, I think Kay Bain kind of hit on this toward the end, you know, the level of disinvestment in, in, in NYCHA also starts with what's happening around and outside of NYCHA, right? Because not only with the median income, but if you look at, um, for example, um, I look at Williamsburg, right? Where I do some work now. You look at along a corridor of Bushwick Avenue from Flushing Avenue to um, um, Metropolitan Avenue, we have four or five different um, housing complexes there with a huge amount of a population living there. And yet what dictates what happens to them and how they're impacted by all things coming into their community and how, they, how they, they're impacted by that is outside of their developments. So you tell me that if for one, one housing development, for example, has 3,500 3, families that they should not be allowed a seat on the community board to dictate what happens and have a conversation about how they're impacted by the decisions that people that sometimes don't look like them aren't, you know, um, having discussions about, right? That's that's violence. That's trauma. And 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 I just want to commend Kay Bain for this because I'm actually trying to do. And when I heard he did this, I'm trying to do the same thing now. Is and Kay, correct me if I'm wrong. He fought to get one of his youth members on a community board, yeah. right? And and got that done. That's chain. Yeah. It because took so many people look at that in person, they're yeah. gonna say, you know what? We're gonna change this system. We're gonna change this up. We can do this. But nobody took their time to say, this is how you do it. Let me teach you. Let me invest in you. Let me go with you your first night of that meeting. Let me teach you how to have that conversation. No one says that to our young people. And in NYCHA, that's part of the problem because when you live with years of disinvestment, and, and I found this through the work that I'm doing now. Like we've been there doing some work and I started doing the work there as a volunteer doing shooting responses and things like that. But to even overcome as a community person, the level of disinvestment to get people to trust you right. with levels of disinvestment, it doesn't happen overnight. Now, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sell a dream to nobody. It can happen, but it takes a level of investment for people to see your consistency because everything about NYCHA and those that, that benefit from NYCHA has been inconsistent. Uh, and I mean that, you know, even with our electeds, Shaker, this is what I tell you. I love you, but I will hold you accountable too, right? You better, like, you better. You know, um, we can't just see you when you need those 3,000 votes, mm -hmm. right? We need to see you there looking at why are the lights dim and I'm afraid to walk out my building? Why is the scaffolding up for five years and nothing's happened? And I get mugged every other night because of it. I'm just... I'm, being you know hypothetical, but oh, you know, but that happens, right? This happens. So and 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 why are there more rats living there than we are? <laughs> you know, like looking at all these things, we have to say to ourselves that NYCHA is, is you know, and, and they may be trying to do some good things now, but the level of trauma that they're responsible for, for the level of disinvestment that they've had in um, housing complexes, is criminal. That's criminal. That's criminal. Right. You understand? Yep. I mean, that's criminal. And not only is it criminal, but those families deserve to be, um, you know, compensated for the levels of disinvestment in them. Mm -hmm. and, and why not start with trying to change how those people are empowered? Absolutely. That is criminal. You're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, it, it's the history of the public housing in this country, in this city, too, really emphasizes that point that you made. Um, okay, one of the questions I wanted to ask you that I'm seeing here from, uh, from our audience too is about uh, schools. Do you all speak to kids in schools? How do we make sure schools are safe spaces um, and not places where we're suspending, expelling, or policing our youth? How, does, how do schools play into this? So in 2009, we, uh, we went to city council. I was actually working there with a council member at the time. Um, 
and we went to uh, Jumani's administration. We went to Quinn, the speaker, and we got $4.8 million to initially to try to bring some something different, something impactful into New York City. It was done by the state on a certain level already. So others, it wasn't the first time, but we went to, to Speaker Quinn. I think um, Kamali Gray got murdered and we said, if this happened in an affluent neighborhood, there would be a task force. We would have something for the people. And that $4.8 million investment is what Juan and I helped to grow to over $50 million of investment around New York City. And we call that the crisis management system, Eric Ford, A.T. Mitchell, others were pioneers in this with me, co-founders of this with me. And so in that system, what we all understood, leaders like Juan, myself, um, from our training, from our mentorship, we understood that you needed a holistic approach. So in our system, there is a component that speaks directly to the school buildings in the areas where we work and connected to our catchment areas. So you can't do this work without taking a holistic approach. It's written into the way that we kind of set it up to be done. And so when you know that uh, you have a young person's attention, let's say for a few hours a day, but then they go to school, right? I think those are the spaces where we kind of have to divide ourselves. So in the mornings before students go into schools, if it's PS 111 near Queensbridge or PS 76, we're in front of the middle school, the elementary school. We do um, assemblies in schools because these are our nieces and our nephews. These are, you know, family members of family members. These are the futures that we're looking after. So we make sure to intentionally interact with schools and young people attending schools now. Most of the young people on our caseloads that we work with, we call participants, I call them youth builders that we work with, they are what is deemed high risk. These are young people who many times do not feel challenged by school, do not feel engaged, invited by the school building. I was one of those people who didn't find school was a place where I was being spoken to, right? So I would have been high risk by the seven criteria that we look at. Uh, running with street organizations, access to a firearm, recently uh, recipient recip of violence, recently perpetuated violence. So all of these things we look at, but we do have a specific and direct component that puts us into the local schools. Um, Shaker, really quickly on that too, um, and, and Kay Bain probably remembers this, but it's also, you know, sometimes that's what we call part of some of the wraparound services that are given to the schools to work with some of the people we work with on the ground. But this is why you need um, leaders on the ground behind this work, you know, like Kay Bain, um, Erica Ford, like he mentioned, A.T. Mitchell, the pioneers of this, right? So you need those folks on the ground who are willing and able to say, you know what, you're giving this school, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to work with our kids or, you know, whatever. Um, and my kids aren't allowed in the school. Hmm. You know, it happened to me in Bed-Stuy. You know what I did? We, we went to that school and I said, we're gonna petition that you not be the school that's associated with, with, with our site. Because if you're telling the kid that I'm working with that he can't be there, if you're telling him that you don't want him there, then guess yeah. what? You don't need to be the school providing these services in our community. And that's we're right. gonna ensure that. But you need um, leaders like that on the ground that are willing to do stuff like that. And you also need kind of like people in elected seats that are gonna be bold enough to go outside of the box and say, Yes, I agree with that method because this can't, it can't turn into pork that we get, give everybody else at the expense of the people that have already been hurt behind yeah. a lot of this disinvestment. That's very powerful to hear. And you're absolutely right. And I think that this notion of wraparound services at community schools is such a critical piece of this too. I mean, schools being hubs to provide services and be a part of the organizing. And if they're not, and if they're criminalizing our youth, they're pushing them out of schools, then they can't be a part of this, of this effort either. Um, another question, this is a, this is a hard one, and I'm, I'm curious what, what both y'all think about this question too, is how do we bring victims of violence into this process, victims of gun violence? How do we bring them into this process? What if they aren't ready or willing to forgive? And I'm sure you've guys come across this a lot in your work too, but how do we engage victims in that way? Can we step back from that question for a second and understand that Juan's brother, is a victim of gun violence. He was a 17 year old, maybe 16 at the time year old child who had faced trauma, who had no healing, who was moving off survival mode and survival mode mentality, making survival choices. This is a child yeah. who then spent the, the latter part of his life, his adult life 
in, in a cage for one alleged mistake or one decision, right? So who, where does the victim start or stop, right? The amount of grief that I imagine his brother must feel knowing that he was in that interaction that led to someone losing their life. And then to sit in that for 20 years, but also the loss of life on the other side, I'm not taking away, but we, we, we only look at it from one perspective. And I'm somebody who has had family members' lives taken. I have buried family members. I have buried participants, young people that I've worked with for years and seen them murdered. I have the bloody t-shirt in my closet for Ruga Dawn, God bless his soul. We were on scene five minutes after he was murdered. And we came with forgiveness because we understand the one who pulls the gun and pulls the trigger is a victim as is the one who lost his life. We're talking about human justice. So this water ain't for everybody. If you're not really ready, right? If you're not really ready to see the humanity in it, then just be Everyone. careful and clear on what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. And, and shake it to that end, you know, um, K. Bain's totally right. You know, um, we, we definitely do work with, with victims, um, but we sometimes do it through those that are doing the work directly with them. Right, like we have mothers who've lost kids who work with us who now see the importance of cutting into some of that um, conflict in order for no one else to be their child who was killed, but also no one else be that child who got caught with that gun, is incarcerated, or may have lost their lives behind that gun. Right, so if, if like Kay Bain said, you know, if you can't stomach the fact that we're gonna deal with two realities here and undo trauma in two different ways here then this may not be the level of work that you get into or support because the reality is that in order to do that human, you know, change, right, get into that human um, element that we never seen in our communities, right? Because think about it. It's sad that I become more visual and more loved and respected when I either I die or I kill someone in my community. Something's wrong with that. But that, was, that did not grow out of me and my neighbors creating that circumstance. It's about the circumstances around us that created that environment that we're now used to or that we've accepted. So that's what we're trying to undo here, that type of trauma, that type of, that type of disinvestment, right? So, you know, the work here is really about ending gun violence, not in the typical way, Ending gang violence, not in the typical way, but ending gun violence and gang violence and all these other forms of violence by saying, you know what, both victim and perpetrator here need a level of investment in their lives that's going to transform this community where someone is going to say, I don't need to pick up a gun to argue with my neighbor. I don't need to take my neighbor's life. My, my neighbor's life means something to me as much as it means it, it, my life means to him, right? So this is where we're going, right? Similar to what we, what we say when we do um, try to end violence against women, for example, right? I never, you know, as I, that's work that I love, but I had to find a way in my own life to forgive the fact that there was a man that would beat my mother to the pulp and do work with those men in order to ask for the change that I'm looking for so that men can stop beating women in the way that my mother was beaten. So it took me having to say to myself, where do I find the level of forgiveness for whatever it is that he claims he experienced to do and hold him accountable in a way where I never have to think about another woman being my mother, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and that was hard because I had to realize that one of the reasons I love perpetrating violence on other people was because I used to love perpetrating violence against people who were bullies. But that's because it was the man bullying my mother. You understand? Like you have to unpack a lot of this trauma, man. It, it's it's so deep um, and so real um, that the things that we sometimes carry. And if you're looking for an overnight solution, like I said, um, there's no way that you do that and get real transformation from anyone. And that I think that was such a great answer from both of you to that question too, because I do think it really reframes that question. It's about two victims, right? Like you both said, and it's about redefining who the victim is from conventional ways that society has taught us to define victim, criminal blame, 
um, violence. Um, so I'm really glad you both answered that question and really spoke to it too. Um, I see uh, one more uh, question here that I want to get to in a second, but I, I did want to jump in on you made a great point. I just want to stick with that theme for a second about you've done a lot of work to, uh, to really call men to step up uh, to combat gender-based violence. And I, and I wanted to, I know you kind of touched on it a bit already, but speak to that a bit too, about how you engage men um, in the work that you do too uh, around standing up, not tolerating and rooting out gender-based violence too. Yeah, I think it begins with understanding that um, I am that man. I was socialized in the same way he was. I was trained in the same way he was, uh, you know, both in my family and my, every man that I encountered in my life from that level and point in my life as a young person, where I started grasping what manhood is, what it is to be a man, all those trainings that I got that started at home, ended in the street, ended up in school, wherever I was around manhood, um, you have to unpack that and embrace that to some degree, right? And, you know, the only way you do that is by, you know, understanding the privileges that we as men have and we share, right? And how that impacts people we love, right? Because to undo it, if, if I don't begin that level of love by showing another man, I care enough about you to have this conversation. I care enough about you to challenge you to stop that, right? Because imagine that man that's abusive to his partner getting a message in his community. When he gets to work, his boss is saying, I heard what happened in your house last night. We don't tolerate employees here to do that. Imagine when he goes to his um, church or synagogue and his pastor says to him, I heard what happened at your home. We want you to know that men here don't act that way. Imagine when he's at the supermarket and I'll see and those brothers that see him in the community go up to him. We heard what happened at your house. Men around here don't behave that way. That begins to either tell me two things, either I change or this is not the community for me. But in here, I'm gonna be held accountable. And you begin to, to work that way, right? Because I guarantee you as men, men on, the, on, on this um, Zoom call tonight, if do this exercise and you'll be surprised. Ask that woman that you care most about, about in your life, what is it to be her a day in her life? And I guarantee you, you're going to show up to pick her up to work to make sure she gets home fine. You're going to make sure that you remind her where to park her car so she could be safe. You're going to want to, you know, you know, and, and again, even as informed as I am, I go through this all the time. You know, when my daughter goes out, my daughter is 20 years old, right? And when my daughter goes out, I'm thinking about, is she going to be safe, right? What are, you know, you know, what is this guy going to do to her, say to her? Or, you know, you got to think about those things, things that I don't necessarily always do with my boys, mm -hmm. right? So it's about the socialization that we go through as men that tell us that we have certain privileges um, that we can exercise at the expense of women that we have to challenge, right? And, and, and begin that work of kind of deconstructing that because to now what society has told us is that we have the right to do it, right? Um, and when we start deconstructing that, and, you know, again, is, again, work that you can't expect to be done overnight. I'm 46 years old. What I learned to, you know, how I learned to be a man to this point, I can't undo by tomorrow. Right. It's levels to that, right? And, and also, when we do that, we also have to ask ourselves, well, where's the origin of his abuse? What's the origin of the things that, he, that he's done, right? And, and we have, you know, and, and you know my story very well as, as a child. You know, I do a lot of anti-violence work right now, for example, and this could be another topic, right? But I don't only live as a childhood survivor of domestic violence and watching it or violence on the streets. I'm also a childhood survivor of sexual assault as a child, you know, molested from the age of eight to 12. I had to kind of undo and unpack some of that within me, and I still continue to do so. But in order to do work with those that harm others, I have to deconstruct that and work on that myself in order to create change. Or I can just walk around with that level of hate and pain that doesn't allow me to build, you know, in my community in the right way and undo some of the trauma and undo some of the harm, right? So again, it's always looking, how can we do what we can at the earliest point possible to undo some of the harm? But if we haven't got there at that point, when, it, when it's happening, how do we intervene in a way where we can invest enough in that circumstance for it not to escalate any further?
-hmm. That's the mm -hmm. work that you, this is human work, right? Seeing that other human being across from you or on the side of you and saying, how can my connection to them, how can my level of intervention with them or prevention with them affect change so much that we never experience in our communities or in our homes for that matter? So, Kate, you want to add to me that? I, I I think Juan touched so much of it. I feel like we just, we need a big billboard with the brother Juan's face on it, right? And I'm saying that, you know, to hold him up, but because we don't celebrate positive um, masculinity. We don't celebrate positive, what we call real models of examples, you know, of people who are pushing for human justice. We don't. So all of the images, the identity, the mask that I wore right, in a single parent home, right, every, being the man of the house at 12, 13 years of age, in my mind, I was far from a man of anything, but violence, it checks off so many of those needs so quickly, again, going back to when they said my brother and I could not learn to read or write, I think about that when my brother went to Columbia University as the valedictorian of his class for four years consecutively and student president. Never happened to a white student, far more a black student. When he went to NYU Gallatin program or Harvard Law School, I think about how they said we wouldn't be able to learn to read and write. But our identity was being shaped by the pressures and the traumas that we were going through. I think that we have to highlight and raise up people like my brother who I'm, I'm describing who's coming to mind right now, my brother Juan, we have to really put their stories and their faces up because I didn't have a lot of those types of examples of manhood when I was growing up, you know? So without that, I needed a place to fit for myself. I, 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 no one showed me how to screw a light. I remember being like, I don't know how to do things with tools. I don't know. I'm not getting this instruction, but there's an underground economy. Mm. Yeah. And you can make $40,000 in a weekend. I couldn't get a job at McDonald's. I have African features. I have a big nose, broad lips. They didn't trust me from jump. I couldn't get a job. Any I've always been articulate. I've always been well-read, self-educated. I've always had no problem handling myself. But I could not receive employment. So what happens is you survive. So again, back to masculinity and how we interact with gender and gender bias. I think we need to hold up you know, the examples that, that really are making sense right now. We don't see enough of that. Yeah, and Shaker, I think it's also a level of, because um, for me, you know, I, I think choices we make when we're informed, right? Like, I'm an incredibly flawed individual, you know. Um, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying that I haven't made mistakes, you know, in, through violence, even with women. Um but I know enough now that when I catch myself, I surround myself with a level of support, you know, male support in particular, right? Um, which was something that a lot of us lack, you know, there were so many men in my lives in my life that were positive, but I can't hide the reality that I wish that all those men were my father who wasn't there. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, as a flawed individual, I, I, I now, that's one of the, I think one of the biggest things in my life that I'm able to say, man, I just messed up. Or man, that thought in my head, I need to do something about and surround myself with brothers that I can call, right? Brothers like K. Bain, or, you know, my brothers who do anti-sexism anti work, you know, like even, even through this pandemic, what got me through it was doing, you know, round, um, round, round table, um, discussions, roundtable discussions with my brother Q from Connect that he holds on Friday nights. And we're there kicking it, you know, 20, 25 men in a Zoom talking about our vulnerabilities. And I say to myself, damn, could I have this conversation at a family gathering? Could I have this conversation on the corner of the block? No, because I'd be considered weak. Hmm. So how do we deconstruct that? And how do we challenge that to make it normal? Because guess what? The level of benefit that we would get as men would really challenge every form of violence that we perpetrate in our lives. I think that's really, really well said. And you're right. It's really deconstructing a lot of these societal definitions of masculinity, uh, of, of, of being a man that are putting on us that are actually very detrimental and damaging. Um, 
And I want to, uh, I'm looking at, the, at being conscious of the time and the questions we have. The last question that I wanted to ask you all too um, is what can the city, and by the city, I mean government, but I also mean all of us too, do more of to support this work? How can this work be more supported um, by city government, um, by, by everyday residents too? What can we do to support this work more, a balanced interrupted work, and, and what you all are doing that goes far beyond that too? Um, I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of this dialogue. It's always, you know, a pleasure to be around sharp, like-minded uh, leadership. So I, I definitely appreciate the invitation and opportunity. I hope that we're able to continue these. Um, I have a fever. I've been on this call. Uh, no excuse, but I'm not at 100. Um, but I, I like to keep my word. And those who know me know my word is, is, is something that I won't break. My life can leave before my word will leave. Um, okay. But I, I'm doing this not in the best of health. Um, so I'm going to retire. But I but to answer the question, because I'm fighting to stay with y'all, I am. Um, it's about people knowing where to go to, to get involved in ways that are truly going to be impactful. Like stop the superficial uh, and donations are needed. Juan needs donations. He has to pay people. He has to feed volunteers. Like we all have those things to do, but it's show up as your authentic. There's a role for everybody in this. There is a role for every concerned community stakeholder. There's a part for you to play, but you have to be honest about the level at which you're willing to go into this. Um, and I just want to say, brother, as you endeavor towards your next seed into your challenges that you're going to face, and I, I don't envy you because you are, as you know, entering into that machine, yeah. that machine of corruption, that machine that I've seen so many. Now, there are a few elected officials. There are many politicians, so many, too many politicians and not enough elected officials. Um, so I think the answer to the question again is to make sure that we associate more closely, we keep each other informed, we support each other. I feel bad that I'm not, I haven't been a support to Juan physically in the way that I could or should. Um, it's been a lot of excuses. I could say COVID, a lot of things, but this has brought us back together. We have to make it our business to support the people that we know are really sincerely invested, not about a dollar, not about notoriety about people. We have to be there for each other. That's what I think has to happen. And so elected officials, again, it's not only, it's not just the resource, the money, because we don't see those dollars. DYCD has those dollars for 18 months and then we're still, so it's not that. But if you know that there's a leader in your, in your uh, district that is about business, amplify that person, send media to that person, hold them up, introduce them, connect the dots, like this dialogue tonight. Make sure that you do that. And I think that's where, you know, the greatest win is for us all to stay close to those who really are coming from their hearts to do this work. I thank you once again for allowing me the time and I Amen. hope I contributed. Juan, always a pleasure. Salute me. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Kay. Feel better, get some rest, but I appreciate you saying that too and it's uh, big and truth too. Juan, I'll give you the, the last word to close it out. Yeah, I mean, I think Kay said it all. Um, it's not just about, you know, having people in office that are going to throw money at you, because to be honest, sometimes they throw money. But um, if you don't believe in the money you're throwing around and you're doing it because you want to say you did something um, but not support it, um, it means nothing. Right. You have to believe in what you're throwing money at. Um, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, th those are some of the things that like to Kay Bain's point. We need people that are going to show up in their, their authentic self, um, want to do the work, um, and also understand that the level, the people that we are investing in have been traditionally the people that have been disinvested in. And, and that if you have, um, I think, the will to understand that and do that, that you'll find yourself in a transformative place, you know, um, I like to say that a lot of people, for example, now find themselves talking about and doing healing circles and all these things. But the reality is that there are a lot of people out there that try to undo trauma and do undo, you know, bad things in our communities, but don't really understand what that means, right? It's it, a lot of people call themselves activists, for example, but what they really are.
are issuist. The issue is because, oh, gun violence is, is my repertoire, right? Um, oh, I'm a housing um, advocate. No, if you don't see how all those things in your community are connected, then you're an issuist. Say, I'm, a, I'm an issuist, I deal with housing and I'll respect you. But if you're telling me you're an activist in your community to undo the isms, then you'll be there and show up in your authentic self to take care of all those isms together because that's the true meaning of activism. Right when you see how all those things combine affect a human being in your community, and you try to do something about it, but if you're just showing up as an issuist, then you know what? Fine, but don't say that you're an activist because you're actually not activating any positivity in your community whatsoever. You're just being popular on an issue that you like, yep. and the hell with everybody else after that. Yep, that's so well said. Thank you, brother, for all that you said, too, for this great discussion tonight, too. Um, and I really like that difference between the activists uh, and the issuists as well. Uh, I, I want to say to everyone here, uh, thank you all so much for coming out. I think we'll end on that note. Uh, what a powerful discussion. Thank you, Millie, uh, for all that you said, too. Um, and uh, I'd encourage everyone to really reflect on uh, all the things that both uh, Juan and, and, and Kay Bain said tonight, too, because uh, these are powerful words from those on the ground doing this work every single day. Uh, and uh, much respect to you both. Uh, and I hold you both close too, because you, you, you both taught me a lot as well. So uh, thank you so much to you guys. Appreciate thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Shekhar. Thank you. Thank you, Kazi. Thank you, Millie.